Welcome to Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adat Chavarim, Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Cool Shul Jewish Cultural Community, and Atheist United Studios. Hey, Joey. I was reading a book by Yaakov Malkin, the late Polish-Israeli humanist philosopher and literary critic, where he tried to distinguish between mass consumers and being citizens of a community of culture. In his opinion, and that of many others, there is a dividing line between what we might call consumerism and real culture or high culture, whatever the heck that means. With all due respect to Professor Malkin, I disagree. Pop culture is culture, or what our friends at the Oxford Dictionary define as the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. And if you look closely, or not even that closely, you'll see that much of pop culture has Jewish roots, a subject today's guest knows a lot about. We're thrilled to have with us Matthew Clickstein, a writer, filmmaker, playwright, arts therapist, and pop culture historian whose writings have appeared in Wired, the New York Daily News, and Split Cider. He's the screenwriter of Against the Dark, starring Steven Seagal, and director-producer of the documentary On Your Mark about Mark Summers, host of Nickelodeon's Double Dare. He co-authored Springfield Confidential with Simpsons writer Mike Reese and recently published an oral history of the San Diego Comic-Con, See You at San Diego, and The Little Encyclopedia of Jewish Culture. Matthew, welcome to Amusing Jews. Hello, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it, guys. So you're a practitioner and a scholar of popular culture. How do you see these two sides of your work informing each other? We almost need not say pop, pop culture anymore. It just is our culture. Uh, the movies we watch, the books we read, the music we listen to. I've had this conversation with a lot of people before, even uh, other elements of our society like sports, in some ways politicians. Um, there's so many people now and so many subjects and so many facets of our world that uh, many folks might not consider pop culture, but really have become pop culture in the way that everything is consolidated through this and through the, you know, our devices and movies and TV shows and movies about you know sports players and movies about politicians and TV shows about saying um, the way that the news is produced and programmed now. They are so much impacting our society, our culture, oftentimes even down to the way that people vote, the way that people are considering things like you know, political policy. Um, and we've been seeing this for such a long time. I mean, you know, even going back to somebody like Ronald Reagan referring to the space program as, as you know, the Star Wars program and um, the way that the references that are made by a lot of these people, even going back to people like Kennedy, even before that, you know, th those those references that they're making to books, to movies, to TV shows, to music, uh, to lyrics, um, you know, that's all very, very important, even the way that our food is discussed and talked about now. Maybe along the same lines, your 2019 novel, Selling Nostalgia, is about a down-on-his-luck writer-filmmaker named Milton Siegel, who's obsessed with TV shows, movies, books, um, music, and celebrities from his childhood spanning the 1980s and 90s. And he spends most of his adult life chronicling the pop culture of his youth. So I'm guessing this is sort of a case of write what you know. Yeah, that guy sounds a little familiar. Um, and what a coincidence is that Milton Siegel's my grandfather's name, but a grandfather I never met. Um, but uh, he, he passed away before I was born. Uh, simply put, Selling Nostalgia was one of the, my few ever attempts at autobiography of a sorts. It is fiction. It is dramatized. Um, there's even elements and scenes in it that are straight up surreal and, and in a way cartoonish and i did that intentionally both because i wanted to make it clear that it was not an autobiography uh, for various reasons but also to just play with the element of authenticity and truth and reliable reliable narrators and the like and i felt that it worked within the universe that, of the world that i was creating because it is about not only the main character but many people around him who are making documentaries and writing books and working in television talking about um these pop culture 
uh, niches and the like. So I thought that it kind of would make sense to have little moments that were almost cinematic in a way or cartoonish in a way. Uh, but it, it ultimately came out of a, almost a therapeutic way of me processing a lot of what I was going through at one point where a lot was happening in my life. I had just gotten married and I was nearing 40 and I was working on a lot of these different projects and there was a lot going on at the world at the time. And I happened to be working on another project that I had been assigned, a ghostwriting project where I was helping somebody with a memoir. And the publisher of that book, uh, which was also working with Simon & Schuster at the time, uh, you know, it was the dream moment. They were floored by the job that I did ghostwriting this, this memoir that I had been assigned. And they actually came to me and said those magic words that you think only happen in TV and movies. They said, what else have you got? Do you have anything else? And I said to them, I'm kind of picking at this novel on the side. It's really kind of for myself to kind of deal with a lot of different things that are going on in my life right now. And they said, we'll take it. We'll take it. And I actually had to quickly finish it and rework it. And I actually, I requested and they gave me a development editor to kind of help me to clean it up and, and to give it more of a through line narrative and to, to fix some plot points and so forth to make it really more of a real actual novel and not just me kind of ranting and raving about a lot of different things that were going on, which clearly is uh, my one of my preferred ways of speaking. And I will say even there was a point where I didn't want to finish it. And my wife at the time said, you have to finish this. You have to do it. You need to get this out. And of course, I was motivated when an actual publisher just outright said, we'll publish this. And they, they normally don't do novels. So they just wanted it because it was me and they liked the job I did on the previous project. Um, it did ultimately come out, Selling Nostalgia, a neurotic novel. Um, I happened to be reading a lot of Philip Roth at the time, so there's a lot of uh, he in there. And uh, I read Richard Pena's uh, uh, early works and so forth before he passed away. He was a big influence on people like Thomas Pynchon. Thomas Pynchon actually dedicated Gravity's Rainbow to Richard Pena. Um, and so I was reading a lot of these different people who were doing a similar kind of thing where it wasn't quite autobiography, but they were bringing in a lot of elements from their lives. And um, I was very inspired by that. And that's ultimately what Selling Nostalgia was about. And I very specifically wanted to set it in 2017 for various reasons, even though I was finishing it as late as 2018 and then it came out in 2019. You know, this might uh, warm your heart as it does mine, but my 14-year-old son has decided that the 1990s was the golden age. He refuses to pay attention to anything that didn't happen in the 90s, which I find both uh, beautiful and kind of strange. Yeah, I, I remember the very first time that I realized that it was already history was I was in a friend's record store in Boulder uh, called Absolute Vinyl, my friend Doug Gaddy. And we were talking about something or other. Doug was a little older than mine, maybe 50s or something. And uh, this this kid came in, probably not too much younger than I, and was looking around at records stuff. And on his way out, he goes, I love this store. You have all these great records from the 90s. Or no, you had all these great old records from the 90s. That's what it was. And Doug and I kind of looked at each other and laughed. Just the idea of great old records from the 90s. You know, because I think we were talking about like, you know, Wilson Pickett and things like that. Yeah. And to us, that's, you know, that was old. I mean, I wasn't even born at the time of that. But that was the first time I remember thinking it is now history. And here we are. I mean, REM is classic rock, you know. One of your recent books is The Little Encyclopedia of Jewish Culture. I know Jonathan has it. I'm looking to get it. Um, what were the criteria for including the topics you do in the book, from Chocolate Gelt to South Florida to Doja Cat? Do you have a working definition of Jewish culture? I talk about that a little bit in the introduction. Um, this was another assignment deal, actually. Uh, I had originally had the the concept. I, one, of the, one of my great passions is I like working with children and uh, and helping them to create their own theater shows. Um, I've worked with children as young as eight years old, and we usually start with a launching point from a great work of literature that people oftentimes think I'm crazy trying to teach the children. Lord of the Flies, uh, Animal Farm, which people tend to forget was sort of a bit of a children's book. Originally, the title, the subtitle is A Fairy Story. I mean, it's quite literally talking animals. It was a way for George Orwell to get some really important concepts across before he died to a larger audience, including younger people. That was that was the intent, um, very much like Charlotte's Web. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, when I've been working with these kids and even just friends of mine's children and, and so forth, 
I realized sadly that a lot of them didn't know, even Jewish ones didn't necessarily know what the Marx Brothers were, didn't know what the Three Stooges were, didn't know what slapstick was, didn't know what vaudeville was, didn't know what a lot of these Jewish tropes were and, and, and Jewish icons, um, who, as we talked about earlier, were not just important for our community, but for pop culture and culture at writ large, really helped to build you know, our sense of humor, and not, not just ours, but you know, America and maybe even beyond. And that really, really disappointed me. So for a minute there, my idea was, why don't I put together a series of children's books where each one, like quite literally picture books, like, you know, very simple Dr. Seuss type picture books that would focus on a different Jewish icon. So there would be one on the Marx Brothers, one on Three Stooges and so forth. There have been other things kind of like that, but not quite in the way that I was when I was thinking that I wanted to do that was that quite direct and whatnot for children in that regard and, and more of kind of that picture book way. And I started pitching it around and you know what? I got really disappointing responses and it, which was namely, this sounds great, but children of today don't know who these people are. And I kept saying, that's the point. That's why I want them to do this. Like, that's a problem. Like we need kids to know who these people are, not only because again, this goes back to the importance of pop culture history and so forth. Not only is it important just to make sure that people know who the Marx Brothers are in the future, but I think there's a connection where, as we know, sadly, over the last years, anti-Semitism has gone up dramatically and is a serious problem still to this day, especially in high schools and particularly in colleges for various reasons. And so I, for me, it really was a matter of if we can celebrate certain elements of Jewish culture, particularly for younger people, and they can grow up, you know, respecting, even if they're not Jewish, respecting all the contributions that Jews have given to America and global, global society at writ large, that would not only be just great for education, but maybe help to counter a lot of the anti-Semitism we've been seeing over the last few years. Just no, 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 everyone was rejecting this idea. And, and you know, I've published well over 20 books. It's not that hard for me to sell a book, to be perfectly honest. But I was really disappointed in that. One of the publishers, though, I had gone to, um, a company called Callisto Media, they really liked the idea. We talked about it a little bit. They ultimately decided not to go with it, but they said, we've been working on this Jewish encyclopedia concept. Would that be something you'd be interested in? And I said, sure. And they said, we'll be in touch, which, of course, we all know means you'll never hear from them again. Instead, six months later, I did actually hear from them again. They said, no, we really want to do this. You're our guy. You do pop culture stuff. You've done, you know, writings and, and works on, on Jewish culture and, and even a lot of your, you know, non-Jewish book stuff, whatnot, oftentimes brings Jewish stuff into it. Like, you're our guy. Do you want to do this? And I said, yeah. So it was an assignment deal. And honestly, it was pretty rigid um, what they wanted. They, they used a lot of data mining and so forth. It was an interesting process, to be perfectly honest. And this was just about a little over a year ago. We went pretty fast with the process. And so they had a very long list. Um, almost kind of like SEO keywords in a way of of which Jewish icons and foods and places and things that I might want to look at. They were very good at allowing me to bring to them suggestions for other Jewish subjects and icons and ideas and foods and places. But there were there was a pretty rigid standard of what they wanted. And that was based, you know, and and rightly so. I mean, they're trying to turn a buck on things like marketability, SEO. Um, they wanted it to be very diverse and eclectic. They didn't want it to just be all, you know, you know, older folks. They wanted it to be some new. They wanted to make sure that we were, you know, bringing in a lot of kind of DEI type of aspects to it. Um, people that were very familiar, like your Barbara Streisands, but also people and things that maybe people had never heard of before, like Tikva Records. Um, so we really were trying to keep it as eclectic as possible, which. I didn't see as a limitation. I actually really enjoyed that. Um, I'm not, you know, that aware of or the biggest fan of Doja Cat, for example, but I wanted to make sure that we were showcasing that it's not just the Beastie Boys or Rick Rubin in the world of hip hop who are Jewish, you know, somebody like Doja Cat, who happens to be very popular right now and relatively new and frankly, a person of color and so forth, you know, is Jewish too. And I really, we wanted to showcase that. And to really kind of play with, you know, people's stereotypes of what's Jewish, what's not Jewish, um, and to make sure that it wasn't just Marx Brothers and Three Stooges and Mel Brooks, but yes, people like Doja Cat or Tiffany Haddish, 
um, or certain cartoon characters or certain other, you know, certain foods that people might not necessarily think are Jewish. Originally, I actually wanted a whole section on people that you think are Jewish, but aren't, you know, like Weird Al Yankovic, for example, which still blows my mind that that guy's not Jewish. The hair, the look, the glasses, the name, the accordion. How is that guy not Jewish? He's not Jewish. Um, so, you know, just things like that. But um, uh, we ended up not doing that for various reasons. So there were there were some governors on this particular project just because of they wanted to be a certain length, not too long. They wanted it to be kind of a primer, not this huge, you know, 4,000 page encyclopedia. They wanted to be kind of like an easy flip book of sorts. And that's what we did. And we wanted to keep it lighthearted. We wanted to keep it fun. Um, you know, again, like I said, there's cartoon characters in there. We talk about Jay Sherman from the critic. Um, there were certain people they they had asked me not to put in or certain things to not really get into. That would be a little too provocative or controversial. I mean, Hey, you know, you, you do need to talk about someone like Harvey Weinstein. I mean, Miramax is important, but also they were a little concerned about, you know, they didn't want to cause any problems or anything. So we were also walking that line with stuff. How do we talk about Israel and just certain things that they didn't want to have any kind of issues and you know and and that was their choice so i i did have a lot of rigidity on what i could talk about or not talk about i had a few entries in there that they ultimately had taken out just because they were a little concerned and so i said okay you know i get it i mean you know look you know I'll wrap that up by saying how do you talk about somebody like woody allen in a book like this like i knew we had to have him in there but they did want to be careful about certain provocations and so forth. And so we had to kind of walk that line because you can't leave them out. But we, you know, how do you talk about that without upsetting certain people? I know that a lot of like film critics who are putting together their list of top 10 Jewish movies, they want to make a list of top 10 movies that includes maybe nine or 10 Woody Allen mo movies, but they can't. And that was kind of how we approached it, actually, was sort of talking about the art versus the artist thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so and you know, honestly, for me, you know, I'm, I'm not going to really talk about my thoughts on that whole situation, you know, on a larger level. But for the book, for the purpose of the book, it was actually kind of fun for me and a little challenging as far as how do we, you know, include certain things that might be provocative for some people without because we did a lot of it was it wasn't about being politically correct or anything like that. We just we wanted it to be a celebration. We wanted it to be a tribute. We we didn't want everyone to feel any real negative feelings while going through it. I mean, even how do you, how do we approach things like the Holocaust? I think we did it in an interesting way where we were talking about the Holocaust, but through great works of literature, through great works of film and art and graphic novels like the great art Spiegelman's mouse so that we can, we can talk about it, but in a way that there was some mediation to it without, you know, feeling like anyone was going to get particularly upset and to keep it a celebration. You don't, you're obviously not going to be celebrating the Holocaust. You, you'd have to be sick, disgusting human being to do that. But, you know, we could celebrate Art Spiegelman's great graphic novel, or we could celebrate, um, you know, uh, and, you know, Anne Frank's work, or we could celebrate, uh, you know, certain other films or, or books or, uh, you know, even, even projects that haven't gotten a lot of showcase over the years, like The Last Cyclist, for example, which was a play, a satire at that. Um, that was actually written within and and rehearsed within the Holocaust by a by a Jewish playwright who literally wrote and performed a play that was a satire on the Holocaust inside the Holocaust. And we got to talk about that's a lot of what Jews do is we take these horrible, just terrible situations and find ways of turning it into art and performance and humor and so forth, because it's how we've had to survive. And that's so much about what our humor and our culture is about. You know, even somebody like Charlie Chaplin, who's not Jewish, but his brother, you know, his half brother was and had a lot of Jewish elements to who he was and, and really, you know, was was kind of peripherally Jewish in his way. You know, just the concept of this guy is so poor and this guy is so hungry. He's literally eating his shoe during a time when people needed to see that and people needed to connect with that. Or people forget that one of the reasons the Marx Brothers became so successful during the Great Depression, that is when they became successful is because people needed to laugh. And I actually have a collection of Photoplay magazine, kind of an early kind of movie magazine, fan magazine, and it's of the time. And there's letters to the editor in there of the time. And there are people talking about how they're watching these movies and they're not using their money for the bread line. And they're, they're, they're foregoing food so that they can go and watch the Marx Brothers because 
by God, they needed to laugh. And not only did they need to laugh, they needed to laugh in a the theater with other people. That it was it was as important to them as food. Like this was of the time people were talking about this in this magazine. And so, you know, I think that that's very important. And it's one of the reasons why I really admire and connect with being Jewish, because we're very good at that. And we wanted that to be an element of this book where even when we're talking about more provocative or darker or harsher elements, how can we do it in a way that will still, you know, find that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, way to embrace it in a way so that, you know, we're not going to make people feel bad. You know, that was just the way we wanted the book to come together, lighthearted and and a celebration of Jewish culture, even when we're talking about the darkest of the dark, like the Holocaust or certain people or certain subjects that might, you know, be offensive or what have you. So, but there were a few things that got excised that I kind of wish had and that I wish either kept in there because, you know, omitting certain people or certain things can upset other people too. So, but, you know, they were paying the bills. So I had to kind of follow the rules. You wrote the screenplay for Against the Dark, a direct-to-DVD movie from 2009 starring Steven Seagal. So how did that project come about? I had a friend from film school, Tor Canos. I'm still very close with him. I work with him on some projects now. And he wanted to develop a, st a script with me that we can actually possibly make ourselves. We wanted to keep it cheap. We wanted to keep it easy. Um, we wanted to keep no, no big effects or anything. Uh, long story short, we decided to do something with vampires and whatnot, but more realistic version of it. I ended up writing the script. Um, a few other things happened. My, my that friend, he was actually at ICM at the time. We were able to get it passed around to a few different people. And we ultimately found a producer that really loved it. And they were saying all the things that we wanted them to say about, oh, this reminds me of Twilight Zone. And I love how it's a very evocative of the naturalistic horror films of the 70s. About a year and a half later, one of the producer's assistants took me to dinner and, uh, you know, we had this whole dinner and he's talking about everything except my damn script. You know, it's been a year and a half. I'm wondering what the heck's been going on while we are waiting for the valet at the parking. He turns to me, he goes, so I have some good news on the bad news. I go, what's the good news? He goes, we are going into production on your script. I go, okay, what's the bad news? He goes, uh, Steven wants to star in it. Now, I knew that one of their bread and butter things was this was at the time of blockbusters peaking and it was straight to DVD, you know, action movies, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal, I think even Tom Selleck at the time, you know, some of these other people like that. And they were one of the companies that were doing a lot of those kinds of pictures, Wesley Snipes, and they did a lot of the Steven Seagal straight to DVD projects. And I knew that, but they also made real movies too. And I even remember thinking and saying, what? role is Steven Seagal going to be? Like, there wasn't even a Steven Seagal role in it. Like, there was no place for Steven Seagal in this kind of very bare-bones, simple, naturalistic 70s horror meets Twilight Zone type of a picture. And, of course, he goes, well, Steven and his team are going to rewrite it, too. And I was like, well, okay. But I did get a little bit more money. I'm a young kid in Hollywood. This is my dream finally coming true. Sony's going to be making a film of mine. Yes, Steven Seagal, even back then, was a bit of a, um, you know, a bit of a goof and all that. But at least he's a name. And they even changed the title of the film. It was really originally Last Night. They changed it to Against the Dark because, A, so many of Steven Seagal's movies have three words in them. Uh, you know, Fire Down Below, uh, Marked for Death, Out for Justice, um, and About the Law. I mean, I could go on. But also, because of the blockbuster thing. They wanted a movie that starts with the letter A, kind of like Aardvark plumbing in the in the yellow pages. It was like uh, against the dark. It's going to be the first thing people are going to see when they come to the blockbuster. And that's that's a big part of why they did it. They actually told me that. And the movie comes out. Um, I hadn't even seen it. Some friends of mine saw it, called me laughing, drunk, giggling. How many helicopters did you put in this movie, Matt? I said, none. Oh, geez. I ultimately ended up seeing it through an op series of circumstances when I was on the road with another project. Uh, and I'm just sitting there. And yes, I'm the sole credit on this film, but I can tell you there's almost nothing in it except some basic, you know, hint, some shadow of my original idea. And a few lines here or there and like the character names, like some for Seagal's, which they just completely added in. And it's another one of those uh, executive decision type movies. By the way, he's only in it for about 15 minutes. They dubbed over his voice. He's extremely overweight. Like his character doesn't make any sense in the film. Like they just kind of injected him in there. And I will just tell folks after hearing all this, if they're if you're thinking I'm going to see this because it'll be really fun to watch and you know we'll laugh at it. 
this is not a movie that's so bad it's good. It's just bad. You've written an oral history of the San Diego Comic-Con, which was based on your own podcast series, Comic-Con Begins, origin stories of the San Diego Comic-Con and the rise of modern fandom. There are a bunch of Jewish names among the founders, early guests, and inspirers of the Comic-Con. Founder Shel Dorf, uh, comics creators Jack Kirby and Trina Robbins, filmmaker Lloyd Kaufman, spiritual patriarch Harvey Kurtzman of Mad Magazine, and so on. Stanley. Why, of course. Yeah, I mean, why do you think this is? Why so many Jews? Well... In the earlier days with people like Bill Finger, uh, one of the co-creators of Batman, in fact, in many regards, um, probably the creator of Batman, who only recently has gotten credit posthumously and sadly, um, or people like Stan and Jack Kirby, or people like, you know, uh, Siegel and Schuster, the creators of Superman, um, who are bringing a lot of Jewish elements into that character, even the fact that he's an immigrant and an alien, if you will, um, and a stranger, strange land type of an aspect, and you know the Ubermunch co concept and, and the like. You know, simply put, uh, we couldn't really do anything else. I mean, and people forget that one of the reasons why so many Jews were involved in performance uh, in their early days was because we weren't able to get work doing anything else. Um, and 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 in conjunction with that, no one else wanted to do those things. Um, there was a time when, and as we've seen in certain movies and TV shows and things, even in the last few years. There was a time not that long ago, like less than 100 years ago, where you had places in New York, you had places in L.A. that would say, you know, no actors allowed or no film or show people. And that's not just, you know, the, the early days of film and, and so forth. And but also, you know, theater and whatnot, like it was that idea of almost kind of the groundlings. It was that idea of theater and performance and early movies and Nickelodeons. And, you know, a lot what was going on for at Bodville, even the like was for the rabble. It was for. Um, you know, uh, 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 you know, wasn't the sophisticates that were going and seeing a lot of this stuff. And so no one else wanted to do that. Jews didn't have a lot of options as far as work and what they can do. So it came together. It's very similar to how uh, one of the reasons that, and I learned this when I lived in Baltimore was a senior reporter for the Baltimore Jewish times. One of the reasons that Baltimore has, I think it's the third largest Jewish community in the country is because as a port community, a lot of Jews were coming over there even well before World War II, you know, back, going back to the, the late 19th century. And one of the things that we were able to do as immigrants that we couldn't do anything else and no one else wanted to do was become junk men and women and was to basically go around and collecting junk and doing things with junk and having junkyards and so forth. And, um, you know, not only did that become at a point and actually a very lucrative industry, but those junkyards were owned by these Jewish families. And that's the land and so after a generation or two and after Baltimore started to develop, all of a sudden you had all these Jewish families that not only own these junkyards, but own the land that the junkyards are on. And then the land started getting developed. And that's why there's a lot of Jews and a lot of very wealthy and powerful Jews in Baltimore was because we had nowhere else to go in Baltimore. We had nothing else we can do. We had to do what was considered this kind of filthy um, you know, sideline thing of collecting and selling and 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 storing junk and the like. And we happen to own the land that it was on too. And it was a lot of land because it was a lot of junk. And generations later, now, you know, they own a lot of land and own a lot of developments and so forth. So similar to that, we, you know, no one else wanted to necessarily be in film or in performance or theater or vaudeville and we couldn't go anywhere else. So we got very much into that world. And as some people might know, comic books, even during the time of people like Schuster and Siegel and even Kirby and Stan Lee. Stan Lee used to talk about this in interviews all the time. Well into the 60s, maybe even early 70s, nobody wanted to work in comic books. You worked in comic books so that you can get a real job eventually in advertising or in illustrating books maybe or doing uh, you know stuff for magazines or eventually you know other things like that. Comic books was not where any uh, you know dignified, distinguished artist wanted to be. Um, and you know, it was very hard work. It was basically slave labor. You're with, you know, a hundred other people. I mean, it really, literally was a bullpen and, you know, it was sweaty. It was hot. It was like a sweatshop. Uh, and they didn't like it and you're not getting paid much. Obviously you're not getting credit for the characters you're creating. The companies own it. The publishers own it. That's why people like Siegel and Schuster 
you know, had to fight decades later to get the rights back or they didn't even get the rights. They just got some money at the end of their life for Superman. Bill Finger was completely wiped from the story of Batman. Um, and, you know, that, that kind of thing happened all the time. So it was just a collusion of no one else wanted to do it. And Jews couldn't do really anything else. So creative, artistic, illustrative Jews who have drawing talent or certain kinds of writing talent, they gravitated toward comic books, which was one of the only places where they can go. And by the way, um, there were also a lot of people from the Hispanic community in that world doing that work. There were women doing that work. There were people of color doing that work because it was, you know, one of the only places where if you were an artist and you were an illustrator, you were certainly not going to find work in the world of, you know, Madison Avenue and advertising. Um, you know, they weren't going to let you any more than they would let Jews in that world. So you went to comic books. Yeah. A yeah. lot of Italians also. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, that it was, it was just, that was how it was. And then all of a sudden you had people like Stan Lee, you know, real name Lieber, you know, granted he was a little different cause you know, his uncle owned the company that he then transformed into what it became, but still, you know, it was considered nothing to a point where as everybody knows the famous story of he wanted to leave, you know, he was like, I hate this. This is ridiculous. I'm embarrassed to tell people I do comic books at cocktail parties. I mean, he wanted to be Errol Flynn his entire you know, it was embarrassing for him to do these silly disposable little magazines for children that were, you know, at the drugstore. Um, and then his wife said, before you quit, why don't you do something that you really want to do for you? Um, and he said, all right, what if I actually injected into these comic book characters real human pathos and emotion and depression and some of the stuff I'm going through? And he created Fantastic Four. And then later, you know, then, uh, you know, with some of the other folks and, and then eventually obviously Spider-Man. And it was that uh, concept of what if we made the comic book characters more connected to humanity and empathy and pathos. And he asked, are we surprised that this is coming from Jewish people coming up with this idea? I mean, it's exactly what we were just talking about, or even what Siegel and Schuster did with Superman. Um, so it, it is like bringing all these things together at once. And we Jews are very, very good at that. Yeah, there's that great scene in Mallrats, the Kevin Smith movie, where he's sort of describing Stan Lee as you know, the origin of all these different characters. And of course it's a movie, but, you know, talking about how it, they were all sort of reflections of himself and, yeah, you know, it's yeah, yeah. You know, talking about Doom in particular. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which, you know, I'm sure Kirby was watching that going, you know, well, <laughs> hey, Stan Lee. I think that, Kirby watched a lot of things and said, Hey, that's my idea. Like star Wars, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Comic con, you know, is a hub for pop culture and seems like a natural place for your interests, Matthew to converge. Can you articulate the role Comic con and the other major conventions play in the pop culture universe? Yeah. You know, I, I think it's important first and foremost, um, even for me on a mercenary commercial level, I, I I've really been frustrated at, people who say oh you know matt uh, that's great that you did something on comic con i'm not really into comic books or i'm not really into comic conventions and i have to say it's not just comics and there is this debate that goes on and we talk about this even in the book about oh comic con is so different now it used to just be about comic books now it's all about these big hollywood premieres yes it's true like a lot of things like comic con that started in the early 70s with this small group of literally high school and some junior high school kids who just wanted to get together to celebrate their fandoms. Um, and yes, there were a lot of comic books and comic collectors and comic book buyers and comic book artists and things that were involved in that. But it was always about pop culture. They had a special space for Star Trek as early as 1973. I mean, that was Comic-Con number four. They had uh, magicians coming. They they would show martial arts films, in both because um, you know there were people there who just really liked martial arts films, but also there's an element of they're almost like real-life superheroes. Um, and you know, a lot of science fiction stuff, a lot of fantasy stuff, C.S. Lewis, Lord of the Rings, you know, that's not necessarily comic books, but that was there. Um, so it was always about, you know, pop culture writ large, not just comic books. And so people who say, oh, Comic-Con's changed now. Yes, it's gotten really big. Yes, it's gotten really crowded. Yes, it's gotten in its own way more corporate, even though it's still technically nonprofit and run by a committee. But, you know, it has, you know, become more Hollywood, but that was always kind of there. It's close enough to L.A. where some of those Hollywood and TV people could come and kind of mine the IP and kind of present some of their stuff and whatnot, even early on. But it's far away enough where they're kind of feeling like they can kind of get away. And so, too, with New York, same kind of thing. And as it grows, it becomes this known hub of 
hey, a lot of these geeks or nerds or fans or whatever you want to call them are are all uh, congregating in the same place. And it would be a great place to um, talk about and celebrate. And yes, market your new movies, your new TV shows, your new comic books, your new toys, your new eventually video games and to- and all these other things. And so it was it, it, people forget it's a convention. I mean, there is a business element to it. Um, and people like Kirby and people like Ray Bradbury and people like, uh, you know, uh, Forey Ackerman and others who are professionals were coming very, very early on. I mean, they were at the first Comic-Con Kirby and Ray Bradbury and the like. And so once those guys were coming and kind of anointing it and saying, hey, everybody, this is pretty cool. All, everyone else is coming out. And I will say really quick too: the other reason why this is happening in San Diego is largely because of Kirby. Kirby was really the spiritual father of Comic-Con. All the Comic-Con kids, when they were in junior high school and high school, they were able to go and see and visit him um, because he was just, you know, an hour or two away from them, you know, up north a little bit from San Diego. And he had come out from New York where all the comic book people were because his daughter had some health issues and she and she couldn't be there for the the weather and whatnot and the the barometer pressure and then the humidity and so forth. He had to go someplace much drier. And so he goes over to the West Coast, uh, you know, Southern California area for that very reason. This is right when FedEx starts really becoming a thing. And all of a sudden, in a lot of ways, Kirby is one of the first remote workers. You know, at the time, Marvel and DC didn't want to let go of this workhorse who was doing comic books for everybody and would just, you know, put together 10 pages in one day because he was able to do that. But but his daughter had to, it had to go. So he went with, you know, he, they, they left. And Marvel and DC didn't want to lose him. So they worked with him and basically made him, you know, probably one of the first ever remote workers. And because of things like FedEx and whatnot at the time, they knew that the material could get there faster and it wouldn't be lost as easily. And that that was a big part of that. And when Kirby goes out there that and is having a great time, hey, Southern California is really great. The weather and blah, blah, blah. I'm going down to San Diego and Comic-Con. You better believe some of his friends over in New York are going, I can get the hell out of here. I'm going. And so more and more people start coming to the West Coast. And then you have the bicoastal thing happening. And they're all going down to San Diego where the convention is going on. So these things are all connected all at the same time. And of course, that's also bringing out a lot of the sci-fi people and a lot of the fantasy people. You had a lot of science fiction people in Chicago. You had a guy who really wanted to be a cartoonist. It didn't really work out. He starts having a magazine. You've probably heard of it. It's called Playboy. Um, but he gets some of his cartoonist friends like Shel Silverstein and others to start doing stuff for his magazine. He's also very good friends with other people in that community who are science fiction people. He gets, you know, you know, people like Bradbury and others to write stuff for him and whatnot, but they're all having so much fun out in LA. He'll go out there. So he goes out there and, oh, you have all these science fiction and cartoonist people in Chicago who lost their, their paycheck. And so they're like, we better go out there too. So they're coming out from Chicago to LA and San Diego because Hefner, it takes Playboy over there. That honestly is a big reason why a lot of those guys came out and, you know, they're running around and they're not knowing what to do because they're not making enough money with their pulp, you know, books. They're doing their science fiction stuff, Harlan Ellison, Jewish and Phil K. Dick and some of these other people. So what can they do? Edward even, um, you know, they start writing softcore porn under suited them and they're doing stuff, not just for Hefner, but others. And so you have all these science fiction guys that are writing pseudonymously, you know, uh, softcore porn stuff. And that's all going on at the same time as well. But they're all hanging out together. And so the science fiction people are coming down to the Comic-Con and having fun down in San Diego all together. And, and these people that, you know, so it's, it's all becoming one big ball of this is where everybody goes once a year to meet with each other and to watch movies and to talk about movies and TV shows. There's no VCRs. There's no streaming, obviously. There's no cable. So Comic-Con was a place where you can watch all these movies and they would be streaming movies the entire time, you know, with projectors and stuff. People are are showing King Kong. People are showing Frankenstein. You know, that it wasn't that easy to see those movies except at revival theaters. And once again, if you're in places like Ohio or Iowa or whatnot, they don't have revival theaters. So you move out to San Diego area. And you got this convention that's showing these movies that you're finding other people that have access to King Kong that you don't have access to in Ohio. Now you can finally see it. So that's all going on at the same time. And it's all pop culture and it's everybody celebrating it together and not just comic books. And that's why it's all happening right there. So I have the book here and I think very appropriately titled See You at San Diego, given everything that you just mentioned. 
Um, part of the subtitle of the book is The Triumph of Geek Culture, which, you know, itself is somewhat provocative. I know in the book, which I really enjoyed reading, there's some debate about whether, you know, geek culture has been co-opted by, you know, mass media or whether this is really a win for the the creators, you know, finally getting their due and that kind of thing. What is your feeling on on that kind of complicated issue? Yeah, you know, there are some people who don't like identifying as nerd or geek. Um, Mark Evanier, for example, some people might know. Um, he uh, is, you know, a scholar, a writer, a producer. He was involved in comic books. He was involved in animation. He's considered probably one of the, if not the, authorities on Jack Kirby, who he was very close with and worked with. He has said since day one that he never considered himself a geek or a nerd. He doesn't really like those terms. He didn't really think of himself even when he was younger as an outsider or a misfit and didn't really think that those people were like, he just, you know, some people are into sports. Some people are collecting baseball cards. Some people are, you know, into math and science. And we, just, we were in the comic books and, and animation and movies and TV shows and so forth. So for him, he didn't really see it as, as outsiders or misfits or geeks or ordinaries. And he talks about that in the book. I, I go back and forth with it myself. It can be a pejorative, it can be something that, you know, it's like certain other, you know, slurs or things like it's how it's said. It's the intent. It's the context. It's who's saying it. There's also been a lot of discussions over the last few years. And this was a lot of what my original book on nerd culture in 2014 was about that idea of what's a real nerd, what's a real geek. You know, it's someone like Taylor Swift says, oh, I'm such a geek or, you know, I'm such a nerd about this. It's like, are you? And there's questions about that. But it's also like, well, why can't she be? Why can't somebody who is really good looking or really successful or wealthy or or popular or whatnot? Why, 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 why can it only be someone like a comic book guy or a Lisa Simpson be a nerd or a geek like that? Aren't we supposed to be inclusive? Aren't we supposed to be open to everybody? Like, that's not fair. What's the right way? What's the wrong way? I don't know. I think that, again, like everything else, it's context. It's intent. Um, it's the times that we live in. It's the circumstances. And I think that's very important. Yeah, you do a terrific job with that, with the organization, with uh, having these different important people bouncing off each other, even though you obviously interviewed them separately. The way that you you put it together is um, very readable and very much uh, kind of a through line. There's something there that kind of takes you from page one to page 500 that doesn't feel forced. It's very organic and very well done. I will commend you. I appreciate it. And that's always been very important for me when I put these oral histories together. I've had a lot of friends and you know people I really respect who will, I mean, literally will ask me like, well, where should I start? Or, you know, like, wh where, where do I go for this story? Or, or I want to read stuff about R. Crumb. Where is that? Or what's this? I will say real quick, I, I obviously would have loved to have done an index um, for people who kind of want to do some quick reference, but honestly, it was a matter of the book was already big enough and it would have really increased the price points and it would have increased like the printing costs and it just became, you know, on a practical level, we just couldn't do it. And I was fine with that. And part of me is also like, no, this is not, that's not what you do. When you're watching a documentary and you have all these talking heads and all these people talking about stuff. You're not going to be like, hey, where's the part where this happens? I mean, yeah, maybe if you have a favorite scene in a certain documentary you've seen many times before, sure. But when you're watching a documentary, you watch it from start to finish. When people have asked me, it's come up more than once, where should I start? I go, you know, I quote Alice in Wonderland, you know, start at the beginning. And when you get to the end, stop, you know, and it's almost hard for me to explain to people because not everybody's used to the oral history format. It's a relatively new literary format, but it is a literary format. And I'm certainly not the first to do it. You know, we go back all the way to people like Studs Terkel and you have people like, uh, you know, George Plimpton, who is, you know, like the Edie Sedgwick oral history and the Truman Capote oral history, um, uh, where they were doing basically the exact same thing. And people like my hero, James Andrew Miller, who did the great SNL oral history and the ESPN oral history, just did the e HBO oral history. He loves our book, by the way. Um, but anyway, um, I, you know, it's got to have a narrative. It's not just a bunch of random quotes all thrown together. So yeah, I don't want people to go like, oh, where's the stuff on Robert Crumb? It's like, read it. Like, read it like you read a book. Read it like you wa watch a movie. Like, I don't want you to flip, you know, like you can and there's pictures and whatnot. But just once at least, like, read it like a book. When you're reading The Crucible, when you're reading, 
you know, uh, 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 you know, yeah, Fahrenheit 451. And when you're reading, uh, you know, Phil K. Dick or any of these other people that we've been talking about, like you're, you know, unless again you've read it before and you're looking for specific scenes that are your favorites, like just read it once all the way through, and you'd be surprised, Jonathan, how few people are actually doing that especially because of how big it is. I think they're a little intimidated and it might seem daunting, but if you just sit down and read it, I've had multiple people tell me that because it looks so big and because it looks so daunting and because they weren't familiar with the oral history uh, format, they were very nervous about reading it. They weren't sure. And I would beg them to read it. Many of them, many would call me three, four days later and say, wow, I, I, I was reading like 200 pages at a time. I honestly think an oral history is a very easy read because it's basically just talk. It's just dialogue. You can read it really fast. I had multiple people who were like, I would want to put it down and I couldn't. Like there was I, I wanted to read the next line so that I would. And then I read 30 other pages before I realized that I go, yeah, it's a little you just sit down and read the goddamn things. Shit like language. I mean, it's like you'll see it flows. And frankly, you know, I worked very, 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 very hard to do that. Um, so thank you for actually, you know, sitting down to actually read it. And, uh, you know, I, I hope other people have actually do that, too, because I know a lot of folks, very smart folks, very folks I respect, college professors that we've sent the book to and whatnot, who literally like say, wow, this looks great. But like, you know, where's this or where's that or how do, how do I how do I read it? Like I have people ask me how to read it. I'm like, you have, a P you have a PhD, my man. Well, thank you so much, Matthew, for joining us. And to our audience, now back to your regularly scheduled lives. Amusing Jews is here to amuse you. If you like being amused, go ahead and click like and subscribe.